I've been a fan of metal music for close to 20 years by this point. I've had a phase of my life when I wore nothing but band shirts and I still would on occasion if my wardrobe from back then would still fit me after losing around 40 kilograms of mass a few years ago. And yeah, I used to have a full head of long hair that again I would still have if my genetics hadn't predestined me for early male pattern baldness. And I'm not going to be one of those doofuses who hangs on to their receding hairline for fear of going bald. And it's no surprise that when Double Fine announced Brutal Legend back in 2009, it was straight up my spiked, bloodstained and of decomposing body smelling alley. And yes, I'm legally obligated to call this game Brutal Legend, because this letter is pronounced U in my native language. You wouldn't believe how many people around here mangle names like Motorhead or Motley Crue because they think they should pronounce the umlauts. Anyway, Brutal Legend presents itself as everything any gamer who was into heavy metal would ever want to have. Large vistas filled with completely overdesigned monuments that would serve as perfect album covers, walls of amplifiers, streams of lava, fire and explosions everywhere, and everything is covered in leather, skulls and spikes. They even got some legendary metal musicians to voice some of the characters like Ozzy Osbourne, Lemmy and Rob Halford, and the soundtrack was obviously going to be kick-ass because duh, what else would you want to use as background music for stuff like this? But why would I be talking about Brutal Legend in 2020, over a decade after this game came out? Well, to be honest, I never actually finished this game. I originally bought the game on PlayStation 3 and I don't even own that copy anymore since I sold it a few years ago. I can only show you my save game from my PS3 to prove that I did in fact play it a decade ago. I sold it thinking that I'd probably never revisit the game anyway, and even if I would, by that time I own it both on GOG and Steam as part of a couple of bundles I bought. And wouldn't you know it, after Noclip invited Tim Schafer, founder and CEO of Double Fine, to host a little retrospective on all their games a few days ago, I felt compelled to finally go back and complete this title. I'll get to why I never finished it 10 years ago shortly, but first let's set the stage, pun very much intended. 2009 was an interesting time for gaming, because that's when console hardware became powerful enough to render believable open worlds that didn't look like they were cobbled together from cardboard boxes and print stick. Games like Assassin's Creed and Grand Theft Auto 4 had many imitators, and the formula they and their more primitive predecessor set soon came to dominate the gaming landscape. It almost seemed like every game coming out was to be an open world sandbox type of game, and that traditional linear gaming was going the way of the dodo. And among those games was Brutal Legend. It's hard to pin down and say what kind of game Brutal Legend actually is. If you just go by the marketing materials, you'd think that it's just a hack and slash adventure. And while that's certainly true to some extent, as is traditional you have two weapons, an axe, and a different kind of axe and a variety of combos to choose from, that's far from all it offers. You also get a sweet hot rod to ride around the place and even some racing challenges to take part in. And there's tons of little side activities with one-off gameplay gimmicks like shooting enemies from a tower or riding your car across a battlefield to act as a scout for a mortar. For what it's worth, these missions are entertaining to do once or twice, but they weren't engaging enough for me to actively seek out, because they suffer from the same problem many designated side activities suffer from. They're just little standalone time wasters and they don't tie into the main narrative in any meaningful way. There are also tons of points of interest to look for. Most of these only offer currency, which you can spend on Aussie's upgrade shop to buy variants for your weapons, kit out your car and cosmetically customize both it and your character. But some points of interest offer riffs that you can play on your guitar that serve you in other areas of the game, and even the entire background lore and creation myth need to be unlocked by finding specific shrines all around the world. I think the latter two would have been better implemented as regular unlocks over the course of the narrative. But one thing that ends up dominating most of the second half of the game are the real-time strategy battles. <laughs> yeah, that kinda snuck up on me too. Back when the game was released, I actually played the demo, remember when games had demos, which basically consist of the first couple of missions of the full game. But there's absolutely nothing in either the demo or the marketing materials that hints at the presence of these RTS battles later on, so you can probably guess that this came as a surprise to many people. And that right there was a big part of why the game turned me off. I'm already not the biggest fan of RTS games to begin with, and as such I'm legendarily bad at them. My usual strategy in these games is building as many high damage output units as possible and steamrolling from one edge of the map to the other, hoping that anything in the way dies as part of the intended objective. The thing is though that Brutal Legend's most defining gameplay features are also its worst ones. Doing a straight up RTS somehow didn't sit well with Double Fine, so they chose to add their own spin on it. 
for one, your own character, Eddie Riggs, is part of a fight, so you can intervene in the battles directly, attack enemy units yourself and even play those aforementioned guitar riffs that deal massive damage. You can also double team with any given unit to unleash special attacks and you can even summon your armed and armored hot rod to attack enemies while driving around the battlefield. While that's all well and good, it means that you're sacrificing one of the most useful aspects in typical RTS games. And that's the broad overview of events that the usual god perspective grants you. You're usually at the mercy of other characters pointing out enemy attacks in cases where there are multiple fronts to deal with. The game also tries to give you an option of seeing more of the battle by allowing Eddie to fly around the battlefield. Though why the game doesn't let you do that all the time is beyond me, because that would have been a cool addition to the whole open world traversal. Another hindrance is that it's incredibly hard to command your units around. There are a couple of generic inputs you can give to your units, such as attacking enemies, following your lead or staying put, but these commands are issued to anyone within hearing distance. So if you've lost some units and are building new ones, they'll just sit there in front of the stage with their thumbs up their asses, because if you're at the completely opposite side of the battlefield, they can't hear you from all over there. There is a riff you can play that summons every unit to your current location, but it requires you to land and open yourself up to enemy damage in the process. It would have been convenient if the game offered more tactical options and finer control over your units, because in practical terms there's only really one strategy and it's the steamroller I mentioned before. Issuing commands to individual unit types is even more roundabout, since you have to land right next to them, highlight them by holding a button and then give them an order with the d-pad. And it's not like it's all that useful. As far as I can remember, there's only ever one instance where it's even necessary to employ this kind of tactic, so why even bother with it in the first place? Targeting all these commands is cumbersome as well. All in all, I'm not really a fan of the RTS mechanics in this game. Back in the day, I quit the game after the third RTS battle because I just couldn't take any more of it. This is especially true because that particular battle introduces certain enemy types that have debuff effects on your own troops. Only, this is never really made clear during gameplay. You have to actually read up on these enemy units in your little glossary and there's no visual feedback that your troops are suddenly dealing next to no damage. And it's not like outside of those RTS battles there's much thrilling gameplay to encounter either. As is typical with open world games, the map is absolutely filled with these aforementioned side missions and back then I chose to do each and every single one of them, because hey, I wanted to experience the entire game and get my money's worth. But it came to a point where this too burned me out on the game. I mean, what is the point of doing the same damn mission over and over again, like those ambushes where you just wait for a group of enemies to attack you so you and a bunch of headbangers can stomp them into the ground? This time around, I did every mission type just once to experience it and then never touched it again. Yeah, I didn't get to unlock some of Ozzy's upgrades, but who cares? It's not like they're all that necessary to beat the game. You get enough upgrade points by just following the critical path and doing the handful of side quests I did, and even finding all the rifts isn't necessary either, so the entire exploration aspect is mostly just if you're interested in a sightseeing tour. Don't get me wrong, despite the obviously dated visuals, it's still a cool game to look at, but it's not enough to maintain your interest indefinitely. The game also has a terrible habit of not explaining things properly. I think one of the most useless sentences in the entire game is climb the top of the horn thrower to customize Mount Rockmore. Because it doesn't tell you where or what the horn thrower is, what Mount Rockmore is, or why you should even bother customizing it. Turns out that the horn thrower is just a statue of a hand depicting the devil horns, and if you get up there you can see a Mount Rushmore looking monument that you can customize with busts of various characters, some of which you have to buy with actual upgrade points. And no, there's no benefit in doing so, so save your upgrade points if you intend to play this game. But even outside of that, the game doesn't really tutorialize itself all that well. You gain new unit types over the game's runtime, but it never really tells you outright that you have to upgrade your stage during the battles in order to unlock them. It also only ever mentions in the glossary that certain unit types are upgradable, but again, it never tells you how to actually do it, and you have to figure out yourself that upgrading the stage during the battle unlocks the single upgrade paths you can invest in for certain units. The game also tries to give players as little information as possible in other ways. During your battles, you can see how many fans you have, which are used as currency to build your units, and you can also see the total number of units you have. But you only see those while the build menu is open. The rest of the time, there's absolutely no UI to be seen. And there's also no list anywhere that shows you how many of any given unit type you have, so unless you're right next to the battle and count up all your units manually, you have no idea if you're short on melee infantry or ranged units or whatever. The game also doesn't give you a health bar to check your own status, you just have to listen for a heartbeat that starts playing whenever you're low on health, which sometimes isn't all that audible over the blaring heavy metal in the background. 
The one redeeming quality the game has is its theme. If nothing else, it nails the aesthetic and also the atmosphere and it manages to absolutely hit every single note perfectly. The most important part here is that it doesn't take the metal culture and lifestyle seriously at any point. Nobody does that, with the possible exception of Manowar. But seriously, and I say this as a massive metal fan myself, heavy metal is goofy as all hell. All this overt anti-Christian iconography, all the spikes, the uncomfortable leather attire, the face paint, the pompous platitudes, it's all a transparently silly act, like professional wrestling. That's what makes it awesome. There's a kitsch hole unique to it, because it toys with typical hypermasculinity, and yet it's filled with dragons, fantasy nonsense, and all other sorts of nerdy bullshit. People give themselves terrible stage names and dress up like clowns. Thankfully, there's only a small contingency of metal fans who take metal seriously, and they're usually the kinds of meatheads who get laughed out of metal shows, because we all know that this is just silly nonsense in the end, and everybody is just here to have a good time. And in the spirit of said silliness, the game tries to have a mostly comedic tone about it, which is best exemplified in the character of Lars Halford, who always speaks in this overdramatic, pompous way like he's Marvel's Thor. However, said comedic tone clashes with the intended narrative, where Brutal Land and its people are being subjugated by the evil Diviculus for some reason. His subordinate, General Lion White, mentions that he acts in humanity's best interest by showing Diviculus that they can be profitable, a jab at hair metal and its more poppy, audience-friendly music and aesthetic. But it's never made clear what this means in-universe. Heck, the entire cosmology and creation myth largely make no sense at all and it's just there as a mere backdrop to add some flavor. The narrative also only includes like a dozen or so characters, and it suffers when it introduces certain twists in there for the sake of drama that could have just been resolved if the characters were willing to sit down for five minutes and discuss things. And if you, like me, choose to ignore all the side missions, the game also seems to have some serious pacing issues, where it seems to gallop towards a final confrontation and eventual conclusion at ludicrous speed, where the game ends up being barely six hours long. Doviculus himself gets very little characterization, and as such his motives beyond global conquest remain entirely unknown. To me it just feels like there was too much emphasis on the style and aesthetic of the game rather than its actual narrative content. Some characters are simple one-note jokes and most of the other ones get little to no character development. Even the ending seems flaccid and only serves to provide a final and very obvious joke about how our main character Eddie, a roadie, is never the star of the show, no matter how big his contributions are. The voice acting is also noteworthy here. Jack Black is perfectly cast as protagonist Eddie Riggs. He's absolutely in his element here. Alright, nice try, lady. Or whatever you are. I'm supposed to think you're a nun, but I know you're really some kind of big ugly demon, so let's have it. Aha! I knew it! Big ugly demon. Kind of sexy, though, in a weird way. Hmm. Similarly, and very surprisingly good, is Ozzy Osbourne's portrayal as the Guardian of Metal. His comedic timing here is spectacular. Well, it's about fucking time! Not bad. Looks like you figured out the instructions, okay? You've got some demon flesh on your bumper, but... That's the way the world is today, I'm afraid. Rob Halford also does a great job as General Lion White, and to a lesser extent as himself as part of the Barons. Tim Curry as the Viculus obviously dominates every scene he appears in, but that's a given by now. The one who I think phoned it in the most, unfortunately, was Lemmy. I've read that when it came time to record his lines, he just showed up, did one take for every line and left, and it really shows. There's little direction noticeable in his performance, it's mostly just a flat monotone and not what you expect from someone who screamed into a microphone for 40 years. In essence, Brutal Legend is a perfect example of style over substance. Again, it absolutely oozes charm and flair, but beneath all that is an unengaging narrative that wants to marry tragedy and comedy but only manages half of what it intends, endlessly repeated side quests, an open world that only serves to house collectibles and metal-looking scenery but not much in the way of towns or anything else that would hint that Brutal Land is actually inhabited, and it's all capped off by underwhelming RTS battles. It's a shame, really. I'd love to see Double Fine take another crack at this IP someday get rid of the entire RTS shtick, make it a solid open-world action game, maybe get someone who has experience in crafting this type of gameplay, keep the lighthearted tone and invest in more character development and that would be a game worth playing. But Brutal Legend unfortunately isn't. It sadly isn't as legendary as it should have been. <laughs>